What's up, peers, and welcome to Bitcoin to the Max here on the World Crypto Network. And we continue the, the, the series that I'm having so much fun recording because we are reading What Has Government Done to Our Money by Murray Rothbard and applying it to Bitcoin. And it, it works like a charm. Like every chapter, I'm blown away with how perfect Rothbard is describing Bitcoin here. And this next chapter is no exception at all. We're talking about custodial wallets money warehouses. Suppose then that the free market has established Bitcoin as money, forgetting again about shit coins for the sake of simplicity. I mean, Rothbard is the biggest maximalist that we could ever imagine. It's, it's hilarious. Even in the convenient shape of on-chain transactions, gold or Bitcoin is often cumbersome and awkward to transact and use in direct exchange. Correct, you can't buy your coffee on-chain. For larger transactions, however, it is awkward and expensive to transport several hundred pounds of gold. Well, not so much with Bitcoin, because a micro and a macro transaction doesn't matter on chain. But the free market, ever ready to satisfy social needs, comes to the rescue. Oh, this is beautiful language. Bitcoin, in the first place, must be stored somewhere. And just as specialization is more efficient in other lines of business, so will be it mo most efficient in the warehousing business, custodial wallets. Certain firms then will be successful on the market in providing custodial services. Some will be Bitcoin uh, custodial wallets, uh, some and will store Bitcoin in it for its myriad owners. And as in the case with all custodial services, the owner's right to the stored Bitcoin is established by a custodial receipt or account, which he receives in exchange for storing his Bitcoin. The receipt entitles the owner to the claim uh, on his Bitcoin at any time he desires. The custodial wallet will earn a profit no different from any other, for example, by charging a price for its custodial service. Casa Hodl, anyone? <laughs> there is every reason to believe that Bitcoin warehouses or well, Bitcoin warehouses will flourish on the free market in the same way that other warehouses will prosper. In fact, custodial wallets play even a more important role in the case of Bitcoin. Well, let's see about that. <laughs> Hopefully not. Your keys, your Bitcoin. For all other goods pass into consumption and so must leave the warehouse after a while uh, to be used up in the production of consumption. But Bitcoin, as we have seen, is mainly not used uh, in the physical sense. Instead, it is used to exchange for other goods and to lie in wait for such, such exchanges in the future. In short, Bitcoin is not so much used up as simply transferred from one peer to another. In such a situation, convenience, convenience inevitably leads to the transfer of the custodial wallet receipt instead of the physical Bitcoin itself. Coinbase transactions, I mean like the, the shitcoin, uh, the, the shitcoin shillery Coinbase company, he's talking about that already. It's, it's insane, Rothbard is a genius, truly. Suppose, for example, that Alice and Jones, uh, Alice and Bob, both store their Bitcoin at the same con base. Store. <laughs> and Alice sells Bob uh, a car for 100 Bitcoin. They could go through the expensive process uh, of Bob redeeming uh, his receipt and moving his Bitcoin to Jones's office. Uh, or Jones' address, with, uh, with Bob transferring, uh, turning right around and redepositing it, uh, uh, the Bitcoin, to Coinbase again. But they will undoubtedly choose a far more convenient course. Uh, Alice simply gives Bob the Coinbase custodial wallet receipt for 100 Bitcoin. In this case, the custodial wallet receipt for money comes more and more to functioning as a money substitute. Fewer and fewer transactions are moved that move the actual Bitcoin uh, on chain. In more and more cases, paper titles to the gold, uh, to the Bitcoin, used instead. 
as the market develops, there will be three limits on the advance of this substitution process. One is the extent that peers use these uh, custodial wallets called, well, banks, instead of on-chain transactions. Clearly, if Alice, for some reason, doesn't like to use the custodial wallet, which you shouldn't own your keys, own your Bitcoin, control your keys, can't own information, and Bob would like, would have to transport the actual Bitcoin. The second limit is the extent to the clientele of each custodial wallet. In other words, the more transactions are taking place between clients of different custodial wallets, the more Bitcoin will have to be transported on chain. The more exchanges are made by clients of the same custodial wallet, the less need to transport the Bitcoin. If Alice and Bob were clients of different custodial wallets um, and Alice's bank would have to transfer the Bitcoin to, uh, to Bob's bank or custodial wallet. Third, the clientele must have confidence in the trustworthiness of their custodial wallet. It's, it's insane. <laughs> If they suddenly find out, for example, that one custodial uh, official has had a criminal record that the custodial wallet will likely lose its business in a short order. Mark Capellas, anyone? Hello? <laughs> in this receipt, I respect all custodial wallets and the business resting on goodwill are alike. Talking about the difference between Mount Gox and Exchange like Kraken, it's, it's insane. It, yeah, Rothbard is so good. Sorry, I'm fanboying again. Let's get on with reading. <laughs> As custodial wallets grow and confidence in them develops, their clients or peers, no, not peers because one custodian, <laughs> may find it more convenient uh, in many cases to waive their right to paper receipts uh, called Bitcoin certificates and instead to keep their title as an open book account. In the monetary realm, these have been called bank deposits, right? You deposit one Bitcoin and you take a receipt that is not specifically tied to this one Bitcoin. Instead of transferring paper receipts or token receipts, these clients have a book claim at the bank. He makes exchanges by writing an order to this warehouse or custodial wallet to transfer a portion of his account to someone else. Thus, in our example, uh, Alice uh, will order the bank to transfer a book title of 100 Bitcoin to Jones. This written order is called a check uh, or well, what is that in Bitcoin now? Like a, a Coinbase uh, custody transaction or something. It should be clear that economically, there is no difference between a banknote and a bank deposit. So if you have a Bitcoin that is like, for example, in the case of Voltoro, uh, where the deposit is registered to one specific, uh, specific on-chain uh, wallet, uh, or the Coinbase approach, where you have no clue uh, how many or which Bitcoin precisely is yours. Both are claims to ownership of the stored Bitcoin. Both are transferred similarly as Bitcoin substitutes. And both have the identical three limits on their extent to use. The client can choose according to this convenience whether he or she wishes to keep his title in note, deposit, or deposit form. Now, what has happened to their, to their money supply as a result of these operations? If paper notes or bank deposits are used as money substitute, Bitcoin substitute, does this mean that the effective Bitcoin supply in the economy has increased, even though the stock of Bitcoin has remained the same? Well, certainly not. For the Bitcoin substitute are simply uh, custodial wallet receipts for actually deposited Bitcoin. If Bob deposits 100 Bitcoin uh, into his, uh, his custodial wallet and gets a receipt for it, the receipt can be used on the market as Bitcoin. 
but only as a convenient stand-in for Bitcoin, not as an increment itself, not as the true on-chain Bitcoin. The goal of the Bitcoin in the custodial wallet is then no longer part of the effective money supply, but it is held at a reserve. Go to the Bitcoin wiki and read the article on reserves there. For its receipt to be claimed whenever desired by its owner. An increase or decrease in the use of substitutes then exerts no change on the Bitcoin supply. Only the form of the supply has, is changed, not the total. Thus, the money supply of the community uh, may begin as 21 million Bitcoin and then as 11 million Bitcoin may be deposited into custodial wallets in return for these receipts or substitute tokens. Where up to the effective supply will now be um, again 21 million uh, Bitcoin, where 11 million of them are just, well, paper notes. The total money Bitcoin supply has remained the same, right? Curiously, many peers have argued that it would be impossible uh, for custodial services to make money if they were to operate with this 100% reserve basis, as Bitcoin always represents uh, by uh, one Bitcoin always is represented by one receipt. Yet, there is no real problem anymore than for any other uh, warehouse or custodial service. Almost all warehouses uh, all keep the goods of their owner at 100% reserve. As a matter of course, in fact, it would be considered fraud or theft to do otherwise. Oh, so good. <laughs> their profits are earned from the service charged to their customers. These custodial wallets can charge for their service in the same way. If it is objected that customers will not pay a high service charge, this means that the custodial wallet service are not in a very great demand, and which they should not be, and the use of their service will fall to the level that the consumer finds worthwhile. So good. We come now to perhaps the thorniest problem facing the monetary economist, an evolution of fractional reserve custodial wallets. We must ask the question, would fractional reserve custodial wallets be permitted in the free market or would it be prescribed as fraud? Very, very interesting subject. It is well known that custodial wallets have rarely stayed on a 100% basis very long. I mean, Mt. Gox was operating fractional reserve. Oh. <laughs> Since money can remain in the, warehouse, in the custodial wallet for long periods of time, the custodial wallet is tempted to use some of the money for its own account, some of the Bitcoin for its own account. Tempted also because people do not ordinarily care whether the Bitcoin they receive back from the, from the custodial wallet are the identical Bitcoin they deposited. That's why I like Voltoro so much, because you actually know which Bitcoin are deposited. The bank is tempted, or the custodial wallet is tempted then, to use other peers' Bitcoin to earn a profit for themselves. Anyone, Mount Gox? Come on. This is exactly what happened to Mount Gox. If the custodial wallets lend out the Bitcoin directly, the receipts, of course, are now partially invalidated. There are now some receipts or some tokens with no Bitcoin behind them. In short, the custodial wallet is effectively insolvent since it cannot possibly meet its obligation if called upon to do so. It cannot possibly hand over its customers' property should they all desire to do so. Generally, custodial wallets, instead of taking the Bitcoin directly, print uncovered or pseudo uh, custodial receipts. For example, uh, custodial wallet receipts for Bitcoin that is not and cannot be there. There are and there are then loaned at a profit. Clearly, the economic effect is the same. More warehouse receipts are printed than Bitcoin exists in the cold storage custodial wallet. What the bank has done is to issue Bitcoin custodial receipts, 
which represent nothing, but are supposed to represent 100% of their face value in Bitcoin. This pseudo receipts pour forth on the trusting market in the same way as true receipts and thus do the effective Bitcoin supply of the economy. In the above example, if the custodial wallet now issues 2 million Bitcoin of false receipts with no Bitcoin behind them, the Bitcoin supply of the, of the economy will rise from 21 to 23 million Bitcoin, at least until the hocus pocus has been discovered and corrected. Anyone? Mount, Mount Gox? This is exactly what happened. <laughs> There are now, in addition to the four bill or to the 21 million Bitcoin held, hodled by the public, uh, another uh, two million Bitcoin of money substitute, uh, where they are not covered by Bitcoin. Issues of this pseudo receipts, like counterfeiting of Bitcoin, is an example of inflation, which will be studied further below. I was looking forward to this. <laughs> Inflation may be defined as any increase in the economics or money supply not consisting of an increase in the stock of the, of the, uh, of the true Bitcoin. Quite an interesting uh, definition here. Fractional reserve banks or custodial wallets therefore are inherently inflationary institutions. So good. <laughs> Defenders of custodial wallets reply as follows. The custodial wallets are simply functioning like other business. They take risks. Admittedly, if all these dep uh, depositors presented their claims on Bitcoin, the custodial wallet would be bankrupt. But since the outstanding receipt exceeds the Bitcoin in the vaults. But custodial wallets simply take the chance unusually justified that not everyone will ask for their Bitcoin. The great difference, however, between the fractional reserve custodial wallet and all other businesses is that other businessmen use their own Bitcoin or the borrowed capital in ventures. And if they borrow credit, they promise to pay back at the future date, taking care to have enough Bitcoin at hand on the date uh, that they are meet their obligation. If Alice borrows 100 Bitcoin for a year, he will arrange uh, to have 100 Bitcoin available on that future date. But the custodial wallet isn't borrowing from its depositors. It doesn't pledge to pay back the Bitcoin at a certain date in the future. Instead, it pledges to pay the receipts in Bitcoin at any time, on demand. In short, the banknote or deposit or token is not an IOU or debt. It is a warehouse receipt, a custodial wallet receipt for other people's property or Bitcoin. Further, when a businessman borrows or lends money, he does not add to the money supply, Bitcoin supply. The loan funds are saved funds part of the existing money supply being transferred from saver or hodler to borrow. Bank issues, the bank issues on the other hand, artificially increase the money supply since pseudo receipts are injected into the market. A bank then or custodial wallet then is not taking the usual business risk. It does not, like all other businessmen, arrange the time pattern of its asset proportionally to the time pattern of its liabilities. See to it that it will have enough Bitcoin on due dates to pay its bills. Instead, most of the liabilities are instantaneous, but its assets are not. The bank creates new Bitcoin out of thin air and does not, like everyone else, have to acquire Bitcoin by producing or selling its services. In short, the bank is already and at all times bankrupt, but its bankruptcy is only revealed when customers get suspicious and, pre and uh, precipitate the bank run. 
No other business experience a phenomenon like a run. No other business can be plunged into bankruptcy overnight simply because its customers decide to repossess their own property. No other business creates, uh, creates fictitious new Bitcoin, which will evaporate when truly gouged. Why isn't this cool? Ah, oh, this rough part is so good. <laughs> The, desi the dire economic efforts of fractional bank Bitcoin will be explored in the next chapter. Here we conclude that morally such a custodial wallet would have no more right to exist in a truly free market than any other form of implicit theft. It is true that the node or deposit does not actually stay on its face that the warehouse guarantees to keep a fully backed Bitcoin on the hands at all times. But the bank does promise to redeem on demand. And so when it's issue any fake receipts, it is already committing fraud since it immediately becomes possible for the bank to keep its pledge and redeem all these notes on deposit. Fraud, therefore, is immediately being committed when the act of issuing soda receipt takes place. With particular receipts, the fraudulent can only be uh, discovered after the run of the bank has occurred. And since all the receipts look alike and the late coming claimant are left high and dry. <laughs> oh, this chapter is long. <laughs> it's... It, if fraud is to be proscribed in the free society, then fractional reserve custodial wallets would have to meet their same fate. Suppose, however, that fraud and fractional reserve custodial wallets are permitted within the banks only required to fulfill their obligations to redeem in Bitcoin on demand. Any failure to do so would mean instant bankruptcy and such a system has come to known as free banking. Would there then be a heavy fraudulent issue of money substitutes, which resulting artificially creation of new money? Money, and many people, peers, have assumed so and believe that wildcat banking would then simply inflate the money supply astronomically. Oh, the Bitcoin supply. On the contrary, Free banking would lead to a far harder monetary system than we have today. The banks would be checked by the same three limits that we noted above and checked rather rigorously. Oh, this is a really long chapter. Okay, there's the end. <laughs> In the first place, each bank's expansion will be limited by a loss of Bitcoin to another bank. For custodial wallets can only expand the money supply within the limits of its own clientele. Suppose, for example, that Alice's bank with 10,000 Bitcoin deposits only 2,000 Bitcoin of false warehouse receipts to Bitcoin and lends them out to various enterprise or invests them in securities. The borrower or former hodler of securities will spend the new money on various goods and services, new Bitcoin. Eventually, the Bitcoin going to round, going, going the rounds will reach an owner uh, who is a client of another bank of Bob's. At this point, Bob's bank will call upon Alice's bank to redeem its receipt in Bitcoin on chain. And so that the gold can be transferred to Bob's bank vault. Clearly, the wider the extent of each bank's clientele and the more client uh, clients trade with another's the more scope there is for each custodial wallet to expand its credit and and bitcoin supply for if the custodial wallet's clients is narrow then soon after its issue created bitcoin it will be called upon to redeem and as we have seen it doesn't have the withethal to redeem more than the fraction of its obligations to avoid the threat of bankruptcy from its corner, then the narrower or scope of a custodial wallet's clients, the greater the, fractional, the fraction of Bitcoin it must keep in reserve. And the less it can expand 
if there is one bank or custodial wallet in each jurisdiction. There will be far more scopes for expansion than if there is one bank for every two persons in the community. Other things being equal then, the more custodial wallets there are and the tinier they, their size, the harder and better the monetary supply will be. Similarly, a bank's or custodial wallet's clientele will also be limited by those who don't use a custodial wallet at all, those that hodl their own keys. The more peers use actual Bitcoin instead of the token custodial of custodial wallets, the less room there is for bank inflation, thus hodl your own keys. Suppose, however, that the custodial wallet from a cartel and agree to pay out each other's receipts and not for redemption. And suppose further that bank's Bitcoin is, is in universal use. Are there any limits left on bank expansion? Yes. There remains the check of client confidence in the custodial wallet. As custodial wallet credit and the money supply expand further and further, more and more clients will get worried about the lowering of the reserve fraction. And in a truly free society, those who know the truth about the real insolvency of the custodial wallet system will be able to form anti-custodial wallet leagues. This is amazing. <laughs> to urge clients to get their own Bitcoin out before it's too late. Anyone remember? <laughs> Mount Gox and how everyone was saying get your Bitcoin out of there well everyone other than Roger Veer <laughs> in short leaks urge leaks to urge custodial wallet runs or the threat of their information will be able to stop and reverse the monetary expansion the Bitcoin expansion none of this discussion is meant to impugn the general practice of credit which has an important and vital function on the free market. In a credit transaction, the possession of money, of Bitcoin, a good useful in the present, exchanges it for the IOU payable at some future date, the IOU being a future good. And the, and the interest charged reflects the higher valuation of present goods over future goods on the market. But bank notes or custodial wallet notes or deposits are not credit. They are warehouse receipts, custodial wallet receipts, instantaneously claimed for Bitcoin in the bank, in the custodial wallet cold storage. The debtor makes sure that he pays his debt when payment becomes due, but the fractional reserve custodial wallet can never pay more than a small fraction of his outstanding liabilities. We turn in the next chapter to a study of the various forms of government interference in the monetary system, in the Bitcoin system. Most of them designed not to repress fraudulent issuer, but on the contrary, to remove these and other natural checks on inflation. Pierce, this is a long chapter, uh, and thank you for sticking in there, but I mean, isn't, isn't this truly amazing? Th this is insane. Like Rothbard has predicted the rise and fall of the Mt. Gox fractional reserve system in Bitcoin. And it has even uh, predicted that peers like Andreas Antonopoulos have warned individuals for months before this happened to get their coins out of Mt. Gox. But, this, but he also predicted frauds like Roger Ver, who, who told them that, oh no, Mt. Gox is liquid, right? Just before it happened. This was the cartel forming. Pierce, own your keys, own your gold coins. Um, this is insane. By the way, the same applies, and I'm sorry for rambling on, although this video is already very long, but just the genius of Rothbard here. The same applies for the Lightning Network or for side chains. These are smart contracts that hold in, the, in a non-custodial way, way, though, the money, the Bitcoin in a reserve, so to say. I don't know, it's kind of different, but still some similarities. And you can use the sidechain tokens uh, as is, right, as a Bitcoin receipt. However, the peg 
of the true Bitcoin and the sidechain token is uphold cryptographically one to one. So here on the free market, we actually have these warehouses in form of sidechains, but they are cryptographically enforced and much more reliable than any government warehouse could ever be. I mean, this is amazing. Rothbard truly is a, a genius. Absolutely. And I, I hope you're having as much fun as I'm having here going through this book. And I know that this was a really long chapter, but it's genius. But because it was so long, I'm going to shut up now <laughs> and leave you going to whatever you're up to. Pierce, thank you very much for joining here on this phenomenal series. I'm going through what has government done to our money, uh, the book by Murray Rothbard. And thank you for supporting the show on tellyco.in slash Max. If you enjoy reading this book together with me here, uh, I absolutely am. I'm having the time of my life here. It's, it's so enjoyable to read Rothbard and know that Bitcoin exists. Ah, beautiful. Pierce, see you on the next show. Bye-bye.